This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Thomas Sterner. His under-the-radar success. The book, The Practicing Mind. Now, without me even giving an introduction as to what this subject is about, you know what it's about. How to think about practice. The focus, the tenacity. Developing the skills, the right mind frame. I don't care whether trading or any other entrepreneurial endeavor, any endeavor, pursuing any type of skill, something you want to accomplish. Practice is a solo journey. Practice is inside. Nobody can give you practice. Tom brings some great insights. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with the author of The Practicing Mind. I love this from you, though. All of life is practice in one form or another. Actively practicing something is very different from passively learning. You will never reach a level of performance that feels complete, so learn to love the art of practicing your skill. Wow, that's a mouthful, isn't it? I mean, that's that's that. how many people across millions and millions, if not billions of people across this world, if they could just... Not that they can't, but if they could just understand those few sentences, boy, it just changes everything, doesn't it? It does. One of the reasons that we struggle with that is because we live in a paradigm which is run by marketing media, which is constantly telling us that we're incomplete where we are right now. So we we really, we rail against the process of doing anything. We always want to get to some place other than where we are. And I think another reason for that is that we've got so much going on in our lives that we crave some uh, point of closure with everything that we do. So we want to get this report done. We want to get dinner made. We want to get the kids dropped off. You know, whatever it is, we want to be able to take things off of our plate. So the idea that we're going to immerse ourselves in this process that's just ongoing doesn't seem like something we really want to engage in. But in reality, when we do that, the sense of incompleteness and the sense of frustration and impatience and boredom and all of those things drop away and we find that we're in this state of being which is extremely productive and also uh, a really nice place to spend your day. It seems like one of the things that you've done very well, and I see this in Zen writings, I see this when I listen to like an Alan Watts, is that you are taking words that we otherwise just accept, like the word complete. If you think about it, (laughs) if we follow the scripts, if we follow the narratives, and, and we actually think we can complete everything, then we are sitting around in a room with nothing to do except all these complete things in the room with us, and then what? And then what is a mantra that uh, I'm actually working on a follow-up of The Practicing Mind now, and that's one of the chapters. And then what is such a fantastic mantra to say to yourself. I taught it to my both of my daughters because you see people, they're constantly trying to get to this next point, whether it's uh, the guy on the highway, you know, or the entrepreneur, or the musician, or the golfer, you know, I just want to, I just want to break 85. And then what? You're going to stop playing golf? You know, and if when you start to be able to separate yourself from this drive and ask yourself this question, you realize that there's no end to the, to this path that you're on, and you're always trying to get someplace, but as soon as you get there, the human spirit always wants to be in a state of expansion. That's the reason why we don't live in caves anymore. I mean, we're always trying to get to the next level. You know, I've, I've coached young athletes, and adult athletes too, but young athletes, and, and you know, one time I was doing a golf clinic and I asked, I asked the kids, you know, what do you do 
with a video game uh, when you've mastered, you know, level one. And they said, well, I go to level two. I said, well, why is it? They said, because level one is, is too boring. I said, that's right. I said, you want to be working at your threshold when you can see that you can accomplish it, but you're not there yet. I said, that's the most satisfying state is to be in this state of expansion. I said, as soon as you are able to do the game easily, you don't want to do it anymore. You want something that's more difficult. And we need to recognize this within ourselves, this nature, and embrace it and use it in our favor and use it to increase our experience of life instead of it can also create this infinite expansion can create either this wow this is so fantastic that I have this infinite ability to expand or it can also create this sense of I'm never going to be where I want to be and they're you know they're like right next to each other and you can choose which which side you fall on you know there's a certain self-sufficiency in your outlook in your writings and what I'm about to say, I don't mean to be political by any stretch of, well, I could, somebody can always take something as political. But when you're thinking self-sufficiency and you're thinking practice, I mean, practice and self-sufficiency, they kind of go together. You really have to stop and peek at society and peek at the, the various systems out there, whether it's, uh, it's media or economics or, or politics and, and all of the messaging that's coming at us in one way or another. And none of that messaging ultimately is going to be satisfying. You, you could have everybody in the world promising you this or that, promising you the world. But the, the act of practice, this is a, a solo endeavor. I mean, this is about looking inside oneself. This isn't about expecting uh, the, the answers and the fulfillment to come from other people. That's true. And I think that for myself, one of the defining moments was because I've been a musician for over 40 years, was uh, when I was 19, uh, I was still living at home and I was working on a piece of music that, w it was a jazz run, I was studying jazz improvisation and I didn't, I just couldn't do it, it was, it was just beyond my grasp. What I didn't realize at that time was that, you know, it takes the brain so many repetitions to create the synapses and all the pathways and everything that have to be created in order for the physical technical barriers to drop. And I didn't, I didn't understand that at that time. So I had this unrealistic goal of uh, how long it should take me to accomplish this task. So what ended up happening was I got annoyed with myself and I felt incomplete as a musician. And I thought, you know, I'm just, I'm never going to be any good. And so then because I was very attuned to uh, this dialogue that was going inside of me, sitting at the piano, I thought, well, wait a minute, let's, let's sit down uh, and write out exactly what I, my definition of a good musician is. That was what I did. And I wrote down you know, a list full of things, being able to play in this key and being able to improvise on this solo and all, all sorts of stuff. And I wrote them down on a piece of paper and I stuck them in my uh, music binder. And then I kind of started working on them, but you know, then I was in college and I had other distractions and I continued to practice, uh, even began playing gigs, but I had completely lost sight of, uh, of that list. I had figured it would take me five years, to, you know, about five years to accomplish. And one night I was in a practice room in the music building of college and it was a Saturday night and I was, was trying to do something and I was in the same position. I couldn't do it and I was getting down on myself again and I was like, this feeling of being incomplete and being a lousy musician, it's just never going to go away. I can't stand this and why am I doing this? And so I just decided I was going to quit. I'd had enough for that night. And as I was packing up my, uh, my stuff, that slip fell out, which I'd completely forgotten about at that time. And I picked up the list. It was an epiphany because as I read down the list, I realized that everything on that list I had accomplished in maybe a year and a half to two years from when I had written it. Now, it was about three years later. And so the stuff that I thought was going to make me feel complete had not done that. And I didn't feel any different, even though I could do this. I still felt inadequate as a musician. And it was in that moment that I had this, this flip-flop where initially I felt this really overwhelming feeling of, oh, you know, I am never going to be, I'm never going to be comfortable in my skin as a musician. I'm always going to feel like I'm, I'm inadequate. But then re right after that, I had this realization that that was because 
I had the ability as a musician to infinitely expand and which is what I call true perfection is that ability to infinitely expand. Be it, perfection has to be limitless because otherwise it's just a number. Uh, it's this good or this many. Uh, and so I, I had that and it was a real it was a real clear knowing. It, it wasn't something I was speculating on. And I understood that. And all of a sudden, you know, all the impatience and everything dropped away. I realized that I was in the process of expanding uh, musically and that that was an infinite thing I'd be doing my whole life. And there was no place I had to get to as a musician. And it was a major, it was a major point for me. That's why, that's a perspective that when you're aware of that, you can, when you're aware of your thoughts and, and, and you're more aligned with the observer of your thoughts inside, you can make that that uh, step over to that side and it's very subtle in a linguistic state but in terms of what it feels like internally it's a major shift as a fellow author i'm curious though how that infinite that uh, that thinking of there's no end point how does that play out with a book because i think your first book was self published even though it sold a ton of copies and my first book was with a publisher but and i had deadlines that changes things to some degree. I mean, when you, when you know things are infinite, I mean, I can think of all my books. I never wanted to stop writing them, but I figure, okay, if I don't stop at this point in time, it won't be done. And at some point in time for a, for a book concept, it has to be done. How does that play out in your explanations to people of like an album, creating an album? Uh, these things have a, a beginning and an end, don't they? They do, but they're all in the process of writing. I mean, I'm going through that now with this second book. You know, I sat down when I initially, what I talked about in the introduction to this book is that when I originally, I did self-publish The Practicing Mind, and it, uh, I had a very successful service business that I had spent 30 years to, um, creating, and it was, uh, I really had it locked up, and I walked away from all that when I was in my late 40s and said, you know, this is not how I want to spend the rest of my life. It wasn't a good business model for me. It was a work for a dollar, make a dollar. So as soon as I, even though I was working 75, 80 hours a week, as soon as I took, went on vacation or I woke up and I had a cold and couldn't go to work, all my income stopped. And I said, this is not where I want to be for the rest of my life. So that was when I decided I was going to write about what I had worked at my whole life and self-publish it. And so yes, that book ended up initially, I couldn't get an agent to talk to me, I couldn't get a publisher to talk to me, and I self-published it, and then it just became bigger and bigger on Amazon, and then, then they started calling me, and it became the, the second edition, basically, of The Practicing Mind. When I did that, when I was, you know, I had so much to say, and I said it, and I thought for a long time, I can't really write a follow-up book, because I don't know what else to say. But then after I spent uh, several years on interviews like this, I had a lot of questions being asked of me of people that had already read the book, and I kind of took note of that, and I thought, well, okay, now I can write a second installment. And as I'm writing that now, what I do is I look at it as I'm very much in the process of writing the book. So uh, when I sit down, I sit down and say, you know, what do I, basically, what's the overall thing I want to cover? And I, I understand what you're saying, because, you know, I was writing one chapter, and I I had to make myself stop because I thought, you know, if I don't, do, if I don't make myself stop, the whole book's going to be this one chapter because I can just continue talking about this subject. That to me is when you, um, there's nothing wrong with something having an end. I don't look at it as a book having a beginning and an end. I look at it as a process of, process of communicating information and that information is in this particular area. And when I finish that, then I'll move on to another area and I'll start communicating that information. That's a good way to say it because I can think about that, especially with music. I mean, I, I, most artists, I'm sure they, they don't, okay, this is, this is our album at this point in time. And then, you know, we, we feel this way, uh, two years from now, we did an, another album. We did some, we did different music. And so it's just a, it's a snapshot. Absolutely. And you compartmentalize things, which I think help to refine your thinking because, you know, you may be deciding, okay, at this point in my life, uh, I want to change careers. Okay, well, you know, now you're going to focus on the aspect of changing careers. It's not something you're going to think about for the rest of your life, but while you're here, be in the moment and be in the process of changing careers. You know, to me, that's the way that I try to approach it. You know, there's one thing that you, in your first work, and I'm just going to kind of quote something about you here. It's a, Sterner's realization, a revelation, that the key to success in any area of life is to acquire self-discipline through non-judgmental, concentrated practice. Now, we're kind of 
talking about these things already in this conversation, but acquiring self-discipline through non-judgmental concentrated practice. That's a little academic. You kind of have to tear that apart, and I'd like to tear it apart with you right now. Everything we learn is through it's through repetition. That's why we habitualize things. You know, the brain likes habits because it requires a lot less processing energy. So it's kind of always in this watch mode of watching what you're repeating, and which is the point that um, I made is that you can you can learn something that you don't really want to learn, but your brain is watching to see what you're doing repeatedly. And that's everything from a physical aspect of your golf swing to the way you react to a certain person or a certain situation. Practice defined to me is it's repetition with a, a conscious intention of accomplishing something. Now you've brought in your awareness of what you're doing and um, you've brought in your attention with an A and you have this intention uh, of accomplishing something. So you're going to repeat this over and over again. The non-judgment thing comes in because, you know, we have this, we have this habit, if, if I can use that word again, of becoming very attached to the moment that we achieve a goal instead of being immersed in the process of achieving it. And you know what makes what makes a goal feel so good when you achieve it? It's because you got through the process of achieving it. You know, anything you you can snap your fingers and have is really not very gratifying. It what always feels good, whether it's losing weight or you know running a mile in under so many minutes, you know, or getting through a triathlon or something, you know, all those things, it's the it's everything that led up to the moment where you cross the finish line. And crossing the finish line only feels good because of uh, what you went through to get there. And But what we do is we tend to become very attached to the moment. We're going to uh, actually have this thing, hold it in our hand, feel that achievement. And what that does is it, it does two things. It sets you up internally in this position where you feel like, I'm here and my goal is out there. So I can't be happy right now because the goal that I want to accomplish is out there and I'm here. And this thing I have to go through between now and then is this nuisance, which immediately sets you in a position of struggle when you do that, as opposed to uh, feeling like, and that's not how I approach things anyway. I mean, when I start to do something, I can't wait to learn about the process. You know, what are the different ways of learning this particular skill? What are the different ways of changing my personality? And then I start to work on this process. And that's where the the non-judgment comes in. Because the problem with judgment is that most of the time, it, it starts with lack of data. So what I mean by that is we say, when we choose a goal, we say, it should take me, like, I'll give you a hard example, like, uh, I want to lose 25 pounds. That ought to take three weeks. Well, that, that's totally inaccurate. There's no data in that, but it's this, that's what we do with everything that when we set goals. Uh, writing my first book, uh, the, the original Practicing Mind, I did the same thing, even though I wrote the Practicing Mind. I thought, well, let me see. I'm going to start a publishing company. I'm going to write this. I got to write this thing. I got to get an editor. I got to get a, a cover design. I got to get the book printed. I got all this stuff. Okay. Then I'll get a website. I've got access to the world. I'll put the book out there. Once I get the book out there and I've got a website, well, man, they're going to come and everything's going to be great. And that didn't happen. I, I got all that finished and I was just hemorrhaging money because I had sold my business and this is what I had for income now. I was cash rich because I had sold clientele and business properties and tooling and all this sort of stuff, but I wasn't making any money. Nobody knew who I was. Nobody knew what the book was about. I had this unrealistic idea of how long it should take me to get to a certain point, but it all made sense in my head uh, based on the little bit of information that I had. So what ended up happening was I began judging my process or my progress. I used, I was saying, you know, I should be here at this point in time. And that brings back a story that I've used so many times. I had someone call me that was changing careers in midlife. In the first phone call, I asked them, you know, where do you, where are you finding your struggle coming from? And they said, well, I've been at my new, uh, they were trying to become a visual artist and they said, I've been at this, this new gig for six months and I'm not as good as I should be. And because I didn't know what a good visual artist was to me, as soon as you use the word artist, you're talking about infinity. And I, so I said, uh, well, how good should you be for six months? And there was this dead silence on the phone and they said, well, I don't really know. And I said, well, if you don't know how good you should be in six months, how do you know that you're not better 
than you should be for six months. Maybe you're ahead of where you should be for the average person working in that scenario. And again, there was this dead silence. And then they said, well, you know, I don't know that either. And I said, well, then let me ask you if you could do what you can do now six months ago when you first started. If somebody could have touched you on the head with a wand and you could do this, how would you feel? Would you feel that you were good? And they said, oh, absolutely. And I said, so it's not that you're not on this linear path of expansion. It's that you're your perception of what good is and how good you can get is ever changing. And, but you're judging your progress based on lack of data. Uh, and that's what we tend to do. So that's where to me, the judgment has absolutely, usually it's from inaccurate data. And the other thing is it has nothing to do with improving or accomplishing the goal. A guy steps up to a foul line and has two foul shots. He misses the first foul shot. He can sit there and say to himself, I stink at this, I practice all day long, I still missed it, the team needs it, and on and on and on. All that judgment has absolutely nothing to do with putting the ball through the hoop on the next shot. In fact, it gets in the way. It clouds his clarity, all sorts of stuff. It changes the hormones in his body and his adrenaline and all these things. That's what I'm asking people to do is, yeah, it takes it takes some effort. You know, that's what that what is discipline? It's effort. It's you know engaging your will to do this stuff. But the alternative, it's not only an unpleasant state of mind, but your per, your productivity rate goes way down and your performance goes way down. That's the reason why we do this. In economics terms, you, know, you talk about the foul line, the two shots. In economics, this is a sunk cost. You know, if you have a sunk cost, it's gone. I mean, if you, if you spend the million dollars on a house and, you know, the value of that house goes to 200000 because of the great financial crisis, the $800,000 is gone. I mean, you know, the, it, you, you do anything like that. And I, I think uh, it's just a different way of describing a sunk cost, isn't it? Yes. And, and also, I would say in that particular situation, we can look at it like, you know, because I have a pilot's license, you know, they teach you all these things. Okay, I, you know, what, what are you going to do if the engine quits? You know, here's your procedure for that. Just like this, the uh, scenario you just described, if you're flying, and if actually I, when I was getting my night flying certification, the, um, my instructor was telling me we had just taken off from the airport and it was the first time I'd flown at night. And it's a, it's a very different experience because you don't have a lot of the visual cues that you do during the day, and uh, um, especially if you're in a more rural area, which I was. So there wasn't a whole lot of ground lighting. And you look down and you can't, you just can't see anything. You have no idea whether it's a forest underneath of you or a parking lot. He was telling me very nonchalantly that he had taken off the week before that with a student and the engine quit uh, on climb out. I, I was like horrified. I said, what did you do? And he said, well, he said, I went, I just dropped into the procedure. And in, in these small airplanes, they generally have two wing, they have two tanks, uh, gas tanks, one in each wing. And there's a selector. So you turn the selector. When the selector is pointing straight up, it, the gas is turned off. When the selector is pointing to the left, it's on the left tank. On the right, it's on the right tank. Well, during the run up on the ground, what the student had inadvertently done was you go through a check, you put it on the left so the gas gauge will tell you how much fuel was in each tank. And then you go to the right. When he had supposedly put it, parked it back on one of the tanks, he had not completely done that. And so it was sitting actually like at 11 o'clock and it was, um, it was actually turned off and, uh, it could have been fatal. This guy, um, went through this immediately. He just dropped into this procedure and said, you know, well, it's either an electrical problem or a fuel problem. He said, um, flip the, flip the lever to the other tank, which the guy did. Now, all that really did was engage a gas tank, and then he hit the starter, and the thing started right up. Now, the point is that he could have gone into a panic situation there and said, you know, we're going to die. This, this, this situation really stinks. It's unfair, and all this sort of stuff. And that's the juice. And at Taking the situation and judging it, yeah, if you lost $800,000 on a house, that really stinks. But in a panic mode and um, and Use, having all this judgment, this is terrible, and all the anxiety and everything that goes along with it doesn't help the situation. And that's really... It's arguably even worse, right? Absolutely. It makes the experience worse. The, and I've always said, you know, when the engine quits, you can either engage in trying to solve the problem or you can scream all the way to the ground. 
you know, so the one is a very unpleasant experience and you, at the end you crash. Um, the other is you give yourself the opportunity to recover from the situation. So it's really, you know, it's a matter of mathematics. I mean, you know, the, the reason we engage in this and the reason we work at it is because we have learned through empirical testing that this is the way that the, as humans, we function at our highest level. It's the way that we accomplish the most with the least amount of effort in the least amount of time and without a sense of struggle. Let me map out a scenario to you building on something you brought up a few minutes ago when I, where I brought it up about the, uh, the acquiring self-discipline through non-judgmental concentrated practice. What I would like to do is take this a step further, the notion of focus. Focus is so critical. And I look at my life in the last 15 years, and I've accomplished a certain number of things. I say, well, this is interesting. I've built this business. I've written five books. I made a movie. I do this podcast now. But I didn't plan it like that. But what I did, my process, was a kind of an iterative process. It was like one step at a time, one thing at a time. And what I've always tried to do is not put too much on my plate. In fact, when I have too much on my plate, I get nothing done. And what I, what I love about your work is you talk about multitasking, and I want to tear this apart. Multitasking is the bane of society right now. It's just no one's getting anything done if they call themselves a multitasker. But as I bring it back to focus, too, it's really interesting these days that, that I'll have people will approach me and they'll say, hey, uh, for example, my girlfriend, she says, she says, hey, you don't seem like you really want to learn another language right now. She's learning Japanese. I just... I, I want to just sometimes just shake her shoulders and say, but don't you see <laughs> that if I try and put that on my plate with what I've got right now, the other stuff on my plate will go down. Uh, maybe the Japanese will come up, but everything's going to get muddled and, and there's not going to be focus. You're right. I mean, when you, when you talk about focus, I think it's, it's very easy to understand lack of focus because we've all had that experience. And, you know, to me, where does focus come from? Well, focus comes from, I would say, thinned out internal chatter. Because we have such so much stimulus around us all day long with the cell phones and uh, television and the Internet and all those sort of things, we have this this constant chatter going on and also we're being asked to operate at higher speeds and do more now just to drop back to the multitasking you're right what they've learned about multitasking is that the way that we visualize it doesn't exist you know we think we're actually doing all these things simultaneously but you know i'm i'm old enough to remember the old days when the computers were, you know, really coming in in the, in the 80s and everything. And when you wanted to run a program, you had to turn the computer off and stick a floppy disk on and turn the computer back on. And a computer would, computer would boot up, read the disk, and then you could do word processing. But then if you wanted to switch over to, say, a spreadsheet program, you had to shut the computer down, put a different floppy disk in, turn it up, and let it reboot and, and find that program. Well, that's basically what the way that they describe what is going on in the brain when it multitasks. When you think you're doing all these things, you're not really uh, doing them all simultaneously. What is happening is the brain is coming up to speed, shutting down, coming up to speed, shutting down. It's just doing it so quickly that it feels like we're doing it simultaneously. But it's one of the reasons that multitasking is so inefficient to be put on people in terms of in corporate situations. And they've learned that. They can increase productivity so much when they stop asking fewer people to do a, um, a lot of different things at the same time. Plus, it's one of the reasons that we're so exhausted because the internal dialogue and the processing and everything that's going on is ramped up so high. Now, the other side of that is that what we're doing, if you look at the evolution of the brain, is that we're asking the brain to operate at these higher speeds. The brain is obliging to that um, from an evolutionary standpoint, but what the, we're not asking the brain to do is to sit quietly and thin the thoughts out and to learn to focus the mind more like a focus light so that it has very concentrated thought in one particular area. We don't ask the, uh, the brain to do that, and it's because uh, we have this drive to do to do too much in a day, and, to get, and we're trying to just constantly increase productivity, and it it isn't working. So what is happening is 
that our brain, that part of our brain is atrophying. We're, we're losing that ability, uh, you know, to do that. And my, my, one of my daughters is a preschool, uh, early childhood learning uh, teacher. And she said, it's very documented that the kids that are coming along now, because of the pace of their life and the stimulus, have extremely short attention spans. And where does it go from there? I mean, the people my age came up in a, uh, you know, there were three channels on television, you played outside most of the time. We, we came up in a totally different environment. There were no video games. Now with these kids, it's everything is going so quickly that uh, I can see in, in one or two generations where this is going to be a serious problem. And so it's it's important that people spend a certain amount of time, and to me this is the core foundation of developing a practicing mind, is you have to spend so much time a day, ten, maybe 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, or in the evening, in a thought awareness training system. You can call it meditation, you can call it whatever you want, but you need to sit still and slow your mind down through effort, the effort of your will. It does two things. One, it slows your mind down, which brings clarity of thought. The second thing it does is it connects you more with the observer part of you, which allows you to be more aware of what your mind is doing instead of you just being in and absorbed and immersed uh, in what your mind is doing. And that's really, really important because you, you really have no conscious choice if you're just uh, reacting to whatever thought your mind is creating and the emotional responses that are um, that are brought on by those thoughts. And actually, when I do talks with people in an audience, usually the first thing I do is say, all right, let's just sit here for two minutes. Everybody close their eyes in your seat and stop thinking. You know, I just put a timer on. And what people find out many times for the first time in their life is they can't do it. And they're, st they're stunned that... Even when they um, exert their will, they, they can't stop their mind from producing these random thoughts. It just kind of goes all over the place. And I, I tell them, that's the mind. It's, it's a thought machine. That's, it's a problem solver. You don't give it a problem, it'll go looking for a problem. It's, that's what it does. So you can either learn to direct its energy and make it serve you, or you can just be a puppet of whatever it does all day and have all these emotional responses and get dragged around. So I think that you, know, you can't have focus if you are not in control and of what your mind is doing and uh, and you can't control that if you're not aware of what your mind is doing and for most people they go through their day completely unaware i watch it with people i, I watch how they their conversation and how they react in their body language and they're they're really unaware of what their mind is doing so i think that those are two really important things to to think about in terms of developing focus and you'll also recognize, because you become aware of your thought and your internal dialogue, you'll recognize when you're not focused. And then you have a choice. I love this line from you. If you're not in control of your thoughts, then you're not in control of yourself. What I love about that especially, if I look at my own life, I find myself in a situation, not that I'm anything special, but I find myself being in a, in a public type forum that people want to try and understand you more and they, they want to perhaps look at you more closely and try and figure something out or something to this effect. And I find that my words, even though I, when I say things sometimes, like, look, you do, we do these, I do these interviews. It's, it's kind of uh, like a mental brainstorming, but I often don't have attachment to the words. So if I'm in a conversation with someone, it's interesting so many times to watch people fixate on the words and, and they, they want to draw uh, the, the, some kind of a emotional inference from me, from the words. And often many times, I'm viewing the words like a sunk cost. Hey, look, we're just having some some mental jousting here, some mental brainstorming. I don't let it stick to me, so to speak. But when I look at other people, the way that their inability sometimes to to deal with words and to to put things in context, people are really struggling with that these days. The things that control the mind, as you say, the the thoughts, the the you know the somebody said this about me or or you know I, I heard this insult and, and it brings them down for the entire day. And, and you and I both know these depressions uh, depression uh, statistics are off the charts. I mean they're 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 gacking people up on all kinds of meds to deal with things that you and I both know they would be so much better off if they just simply started to understand something about the moment of right now. Yeah, you know. That's interesting that you bring that story up uh, because I remember when my daughter was in, uh, one of my daughters was in middle school, she came home and she was upset about what another girl said about her hair. I said, uh, it was like 4.30 and I said, um, 
I said, so when did that happen? And she said, right when I got into school and I was at my locker. I said, so that was like, what, 8 o'clock this morning? And she said, yeah. And I said, and it's 4.30 and you're still ruminating about it. I said, that thought has been running through your head over and over and over again. And every time it, it re-triggers, you experience all the emotions that go along with it. You know, you get upset, you get your feelings are hurt, you get angry, and I should have said this, and uh, all this stuff. I said, it's so much wasted energy. I said, you know, just let it go. And that's something that, you know, I've actually thought about it because I see so many people offended today. And I thought, I can't imagine something somebody that someone would say to me that would make me feel so offended because I don't identify myself with what someone else would say or maybe it's because I just live in this moment and it comes and, and whatever that thing is I just let it go I, I don't know but uh, I, I think your point is really well taken that we do need to uh, you know we need to learn to be in the present moment the present moment as they say is the only point of reality it's only that's the only point where we're really touched with reality the mind doesn't like the present moment because there's nothing for it it feels like there's nothing for it to do there's no problem to solve it wants to worry about what's going to happen in the future oh man mama you know you hear your mind say things like well if this happens if that it runs through all these scenarios you know or it's in a state of regret i wish i had done this yesterday i wish i had said that boy if i if i had done this 10 years ago i'd be in this different place it's everywhere but right here and now doing what we're doing right now and it really resists that and as I said most people are completely unaware of that they're just they're just running around all day with their mind and experiencing everything that their mind wants to chew on bringing up staying in the present just to kind of pass along a, an experience from my world uh, money markets stuff like that it's amazing how many uh, fantastic investors really have have put in motion exactly what you're talking about the moment of right now i can just think of multiple and this this is going to go beyond investing this can go all types of business etc but that moment of now there's something really special there because if you start to think about hey what's going to happen tomorrow or i mean you know from a business perspective nobody can predict anything with any regularity the top economists the top politicians there is no one that's got a track record of predictions that any thinking rational human being would ever bet on but on the flip side emotionally we allow ourselves to listen to this chatter all the time thinking well maybe this this guy he's he's got the next thing that's going to happen tomorrow and no one does but the moment of now is some solace there's some truth in the moment of now Absolutely. I, and I love the way that you put that because the, uh, and, and, and uh, no, I, I should also say that I have been contacted by many in, uh, people involved in investing. I was kind of surprised that the, the practicing mind was such a big hit with uh, people that were involved in investing. But that was one of the reasons uh, because investing by nature is something where you're, you're basically uh, gambling on the future. There's a certain aspect of it which has to take uh, a time other than right now into consideration. But then what ends up happening is, is there's this immediate attachment to this future point and then you have all these things of what ifs and what if, what if, and all that's, that's not now. That's, you know, as, as soon as that happens, you've immediately taken out of the, you know, going out of the now. So I think that, you know, I have found that, and I should say that Everything I've written about, I have to work at. I have to practice that. And I tell people that, you know, if you look at this stuff that we're talking about here and you say, well, if I could be good at that, then I'd be happy. Well, see, now you're back to where we started in the beginning, you know, where you're saying, um, I've got this goal and it's out there and I can't be happy right now because I'm not good at this practicing mind stuff. But if once I get good at it, then I can be happy. No, the, it's the, it's the awareness that you can practice this stuff and that you maintain that practice. And part of that practice is falling off the wagon and putting yourself back on the wagon. So, I would say that I have to do this stuff. Uh, I have to remind myself to be in the present moment and stop that judgment. Whenever I start to feel stressed, I know I'm not in the present moment. And, but because I'm aware of my thoughts, I, it, I, that, my experience of that is, oh, I'm having a stressful thought. I must not be in the present moment. And I bring myself back. And I think people also need to remember that it's like exercising, you know, you don't master exercise. You don't get to a point in exercising where you say, you know what, 
I've mastered exercising. I don't need to exercise for the rest of my life. It's part of your healthy lifestyle. And working at this stuff is part of your uh, healthy mindset and learning to be in control and empowering yourself. And I actually had a guy I was speaking at a university and he was an older guy and he brought up kind of, it, it was kind of a, an amusing story, but the president of the university had asked me to come and speak to the department heads. At the end, there was this Q&A session and this guy said he had read the book and he said, you know, my wife and I, we've had this running thing going on for many years of marriage. And he said, uh, you know, her complaint is that I don't, I'm not engaged with her when she's talking to me. And he said, I, I have to admit that she's right. And my, my mind's kind of always all over the place. And she starts talking to me and I'm daydreaming about something else. He said, so he said, after I read your book, he said, I found that I was really becoming fully engaged in our conversations. And I, I felt pretty cool about it. And he said, but, you know, the other day we were riding in the car and this was down in Kentucky. He said, uh, she mentioned this other university that was in Kentucky, and he said, it immediately triggered this thought that I had to correspond with a professor over there about a, a certain matter. And he said, and I, my mind just took off on that pathway, and I was uh, having this conversation of what I need to email him and all this stuff. He said, no, I kind of woke up to the fact that she had been talking for 30, 45 seconds, and I, didn't, I had no idea what she just said. He said, and I brought myself back, and when I was listening to her, he said, but... So, and this is the punchline. He said, so it would appear to me that I'm not very good at this. And I said, I think you're missing the big picture here. I said, if you look at, you just said through your whole marriage, you have not been engaged. I said, now you're not only engaged some of the time, if not much of the time, but you're self-correcting. When you dropped out of engagement, you actually caught yourself and pulled yourself back into the moment. And I said, you know, now you have all this power that you didn't have before. So my point is is that we need to look at this whole process like that. It, there's the repetition with intention. Here, you know, here's the goal I want to accomplish. It's being in the present moment. It's being non-judgmental. And, and there are going to be times where, and some, some days will be worse than others, where, you know, I'm getting pulled out. And some, some issues are going to be more difficult than others because it might be an illness in the family or, you know, uh, maybe a job is at, at stake or something like that. I said, but you will, you just keep pulling yourself back and you don't judge how you're doing. As long as you keep pulling yourself back, then it's a perfect practice. Now I have to go ahead since I already said something uh, not, not necessarily bad about my girlfriend, but I have to admit what you just described in that situation is me a lot. Uh, I'll hear one thing and then my brain goes that it triggers another thought somewhere and I always have to self-correct. The only problem on the self-correction is often when you do self-correct, somebody else is watching you self-correct. They see you self-correct, and then they're looking at you going, I'm not happy now. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, because they know what you've just done. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, listen, I want to take apart for a moment meditation. And I want to just give my kind of just real basic synopsis. And I want to kind of read something from you as well, too. Because look, people out there right now, I know people are going to hear the phrase meditation and they're going to be like, nah, okay, I'm tuned out. Some people will definitely do that. But here's the, the, and this is, I'm paraphrasing from you, but if you're going to meditate or if you're just going to sit still and, and try not to have thoughts, can you, how long can you stay in that situation? Will you catch your mind producing thoughts? Can you turn it off? And if you can turn it off, I think then you're at that kind of that peaceful meditative state. But turning off those thoughts, that's not easy stuff. That's not easy at all. And I, I would also pass along for me personally, I think the first time that I experienced turning off the thoughts, I had to be in a yoga practice. And I didn't even appreciate uh, that the yoga practice was going to do that to me, that the yoga practice itself was going to beat the tar out of me, and that halfway through it, I would then be in a situation where I could not have thoughts. So that was amazing to me. That was an amazing revelation to me. Why don't we talk about meditation some, and, and perhaps people that uh, that hear the phrase, and I, and I by no stretch am I going to say I'm, I'm the master meditator, because I'm not, but I appreciate and I understand this moment of now, and I appreciate how difficult it is to turn the thoughts off. Well, I think, you know, you're right. The word meditation, and I've, it, it's a label, and it has a lot of uh, connotations, you know, depending on who you are, which is why I came up with the phrase thought awareness training, because in the context of what we're talking about here with developing a, a, a practice in mind is that 
what we're trying to do is develop not only awareness of our thoughts, but also some control over the uh, the quantity of thoughts that we have. And as we said early on, you can't control the quantity if you don't if you're not even aware the thoughts are being produced. But I would say that the way that I would tell people to approach it is that. Yes, you at some point you will experience uh, a still mind. Now, what's interesting about that is that as soon as you say, when you're in a meditative state, a thought awareness training session, when you say, hey, my mind is still, it's no longer still. That, that's the paradox because you have to have a thought to be, you know, <laughs> analyzing that. Exactly. But the point is, is that, and what I tell people is just look at quieting the mind. You're just using that as a rudder because. You know, we're not trying to create uh, yogis, you know, here. We're, what we're trying to do is improve the quality of our life and give ourselves an awareness that we don't normally have and that is not fostered in our culture. When we meditate, I think that what people need to realize is that it's the moment that you catch your mind running off. That's really the moment of expansion. It's like a repetition. And to me, that is where the juice is, as they say. That's really what you're trying to accomplish. And I'm always amused when people say, you know, I tried meditation, I'm not very good at it. Well, why is that? Well, because I just, I'm always chasing my mind. I said, well, that's a good meditation. Uh, well, how can that be? I said, well, because you can't chase your mind if you're not aware of what your mind is doing. You're chasing it because you're aware. If you weren't chasing it, it would just be going someplace and you would be going with it. So the fact that you're catching your mind and pulling it back means that your awareness is developing. And also, every time that you pull it back, in that microsecond when you catch it and you wake up and you go, oh, it's at the grocery store and I'm supposed to be watching my breath, you know, you're, that's when your willpower is strengthening because you pull it back. So if you, what, what a lot of people call a bad meditation, it is actually like being at the gym and doing a lot of reps. So I think that, you know, people need to look at it like that and really look at the fact that you know, because in the Western world, and what we're, we're always talking about here is, you know, we play hard and, you know, all, we're always like, you know, we've got to get to this goal. We've got to accomplish this. So when people start into a thought awareness training or what you call a meditation, they're like, I'm going to nail this. I'm going to master this. Nobody masters meditation. I mean, you know, you, the people that, that do it eight hours a day in the Tibetan, you know, Himalayas, they may be much farther along, but even they, it's a daily, it's, it's a daily practice and it's a daily, um, I don't, I hate to use the word struggle, but they experience the same thing because that is the nature of mind. That's the nature of the mind. It, it just, it doesn't like to sit still and it doesn't like to be directed. Where people get into trouble is that they start to judge their meditation because once again, they don't have any data, so they think, well, you know, geez, I've been doing this for a week. I should be better at this. Well, what is better at it? Uh, there is no better at it. Some days your mind is extremely active, and you're going to be chasing it a lot. And other days you're kind of relaxed, and your mind is you'll fall into a, a quieter state, and you won't have to chase it a whole lot. And either one is normal, and it's fine. It's just it's the, the repetition of sitting still with the intention of quieting your mind and being aware of what your mind is doing. That's all we're after here. The benefits of that are so amazing and incredible. You can't stop them from happening and they are very subtle. Uh, you know, you'll find that as life, you'll find that it feels like you're just like standing in a river and you're th all these crises are just kind of flowing towards you and then past you. You're not reaching out for uh, everything that could go wrong anymore. You know, and things, you know, people that are annoying, you tend to look at them as, oh, they're having a bad day. They don't have any impact on you because they can't get to you. Because when they can get to you, it's because your mind reacts with these thoughts and then you react to the thoughts. So, and because you're in control of your thoughts and the amount of thought activity is much less, it's just a completely different experience than what we're used to. And because of the way the world is going, as I said earlier, our minds are so agitated and so overactive, you know, with just this constant stimulation that we, we need this more now than ever. And we're really not making good decisions if, uh, you know, if we're not doing this. And this is where clarity comes from. It's where focus comes from. Those things all, you know, lack of clarity, lack of focus, you know, impatience, they all come from wanting to be someplace doing something else 
other than where you are and what you're doing right now. And when you sit down for 10, it doesn't take a lot of time, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the evening, you will be amazed at you know how this impacts your life. As we have this conversation, as we wind down, I start to think of the phrase delusion. Uh, when I look at modern society and this overstimulation, and everything is essentially on the pace of some type of shoot 'em up video game. And what really amazes me, and this kind of gets back to something I hinted at earlier, because I, I always wonder when, when, when people, they'll, they'll ask me a question about something that I'm doing, or they'll say, oh, you wrote some books or something, and maybe they have a, a, an inspiration to do that too. But I find very rarely do people try and pick apart my process. The assumptions made, or at least from my observation of people, is that there's this delusional quality in society where all of this stimulation, and this is just my observation of people, maybe I'm completely wrong and crazy, but it seems like there's this delusion that all this stimulation is, is actually achievement. Is it actually, it's doing something. Whereas it, it's almost like a, uh, I don't know, like a South Park cartoon or some type of uh, the Matrix or something. It just seems like this, this organized treadmill that everyone's on. And, and, and a lot of these are very smart people. I mean, people's IQs probably blow me away. But there's this lack of awareness that they are not in control. And that the, the system, the machine, the society, the stimulation, the, the, the flashing Facebook uh, comments for the day, all of that's in control. And I, I just, I, I really wonder, and you've talked about this as well in this conversation, what will the people, what will the, the kids today that are like my, my niece, my nephews, and, uh, you know, 10, 11, 12, what will they be like 20 years from now? After 20 years of playing Facebook and stuff, what will people be like? I mean, surely some will, will come out on the other side and will, and will get the bigger picture and will do excellent in life. But I really think that there's, this, this can't be a good thing overall. No, and you you really put that well, Mike. That's, that's very well put, and it's it's so true. And I think that you know one of the reasons people struggle with finding quote time to uh, practice thought awareness training or me meditation is because you're right. We feel like if we're not doing something, at least one thing, usually more than one thing, then we're not being productive, and we we need to be productive all the time. What does the word productive even mean? That's what I mean. And, and actually, when you sit still, you are being productive. It's just what you're producing is different than a, um, than what we normally define, um, producti pr productivity with. And I think that it's really important for people to understand that. And everybody is so burned out. And this is where so much of this, you know, this anger comes from, uh, you know, that you see on the roads. Everybody is just completely burned out and they're, they're very impatient and, uh, you know, I, I, I take walks every day and I, I was walking yesterday and these two people passed me and I just couldn't help but notice that this is this beautiful park with autumn foliage and all and it's a beautiful day and the one person is talking on their cell phone and the other person is just kind of looking around as they walk past me and I thought, now here's this person that calls up and says, hey, you want to go for a walk? It's a beautiful day. Yeah. And then they go out to the park and instead of turning the, I leave my cell phone in the car, you know, like instead of taking in the walk or the time that you're with this person, which is the present moment, they're talking to somebody who isn't even there. And the other person is just sitting there kind of bored as they walk along. It, it's just such a crazy scenario to me, uh, but you see it all the time. Uh, they're, they're not really here in this present moment. And, but I agree, you know, that productivity, you know, we're designed to, or, or we're taught, uh, and it's that the feeling is nurtured uh, by the media is that we have got to be doing something. You see it with uh, all the commercials. In fact, if you, uh, I'm sure you're aware of uh, George Leonard's book, Mastery, you know, one of the things he talks about is our, our culture is anti-mastery, meaning that we stay on a, uh, we're on a plateau for a long time. It looks from an external point of view, that we're not actually um, increasing in an ability, but the noticeable increases, you know, they come in blips and we move up to the next plateau. Tom, I've already kept you too long. We've gone over here. Where can we send people? The Practicing Mind is on Amazon. That's on every, that's, that's everywhere. Where else can we send people? It, it will be the Practicing Mind Institute.com. And of course, they can always email me at Tom at the Practicing Mind. Tom, I appreciate it. Hopefully we can talk again in the near future. 
I absolutely loved it, uh, Mike. I really appreciate you taking the time to interview me and also to reach out and, and ask me to be on your show. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.